class of 2021 and has helped magnificently with uh, chapel videos throughout the academic year. Next week, we have the Honorable Mayor Wilson Good. Dr. Wilson Good will be with us next week. Um, we're grateful for, for Dr. Good, who is a part of our Board of Trustees. And then we have Dr. Carla Scott from our music department, as well as Professor Anthony Walker, who will lead worship. Following the following Wednesday on May 19th, we'll have Dr. Debbie Watson, who is the seminary chapel at Palmer Theological Seminary and also a New Testament professor. She will be speaking and Josh Gunter will lead us in worship. And then last but not least on the final Wednesday of May, we'll have Professor Teresa Moyer, who is in a distinguished 30 year career as a faculty member here at Eastern University in the music department. So she'll speak and then Professor Andrew Puntel who is part of our music department will lead worship. So we have just a great month of, of times together um, and we appreciate your presence uh, this morning. Friends, we continue to pray, be vigilant and we're getting vaccinated right throughout this pandemic. I know I had my second shot. I guess that's what we talk about now. What, what dose are you at, at and what are you getting? We really appreciate our community's uh, willingness to be together throughout it all. We also want to thank, uh, now we'll say, to our extended Chapel Tech team, Sue, Taylor, Heather, and Rebecca, for helping us with all the logistics. And friends, this morning was particularly very meaningful to me um, with all the technology that we sometimes have to grapple with there. So we're grateful for all of them. And I want to thank President Matthews who, uh, for his encouragement and support throughout this pandemic, week in and week out, uh, the various chapels that uh, he has been part of and being able to end us in prayer, open up the prayer, uh, the chat. Um, we have done now, if I count all the chapels since we had a pivot from in-person to online, this is our 43rd chapel that we've done via Zoom. So I think we're getting to know how to do it. It's, I need another 43 to really understand it fully, but I am grateful to President Matthews. We also wanna remember this morning in prayer, the email that you received yesterday from our, uh, about our friend and former colleague, Reverend Calvin Skinner and the situation in Knoxville, Tennessee. There are many situations, friends, that we could stop and pause uh, around the world we think of India, we think of other situations that are just overwhelming, but we just remember to pray each day, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. And we are uh, grateful that as a Christian community, we know who to go to with our requests, with our burdens, with our intercessions here. So this morning, you're going to hear, right after I pray, you're going to hear Richard White and Josh Gunn to lead us in worship followed by a beautiful rendition of People Need the Lord by Orlando Figueroa, who is our mail center copy coordinator. And so just sit back and engage wherever you are this morning, at home, at the office, wherever, and just worship Jesus as we gather together as a Christian community. So let me pray as we begin. Oh Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace this morning to receive your truth in song, in word, in faith, and in love, and strengthen us to follow you on the path set before us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. says in Lamentations 3.23, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. 
every morning, your faithfulness is great. We won't have to look at yesterday, not even tomorrow, but right now is what matters and what counts. So we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your new mercies each and every day. When we wake up and open our eyes, we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Yes. Summer and winter, and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars, and their courses above. Join with all nature and manifold witness to thy great faith. Mercy and love.
throughout my history Your faithfulness walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season from where I'm standing of your goodness all over my life all over my life I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life all over my life help me of your goodness. It's all around us. Just the air that we're breathing. Just, just, just the very fact that we're sitting here to, in chapel. <laughs> it's evidence. Yes, it's evidence that you are still good. So we thank you, Lord, that we don't have to fear because your love, your perfect love cast out all fear. So thank you for reminding us that we don't have to worry, we don't have to fret, just keep our eyes fixed on you. For we have already overcome this realm. You have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we don't have to fear no more. Though the mountains be moved, though the earth gives way, we don't have to fear, we stand still, we trust in you.
Well, thank you to Richard and Josh and Orlando for leading us in worship this morning. Did you get the sense that the themes of the songs really are related to each other, right? Great is thy faithfulness, evidence, and people need the Lord. So it's just a beautiful way that the spirit 
brings things together for us as a community. Well, this morning's speaker, I have known my entire life. And uh, because it's me, it's me, I'm gonna speak this morning. Um, but with all seriousness, this has been certainly um, no doubt a challenging and difficult year. But I am so grateful, and I know you are also, that we will be able to soon celebrate the good efforts of the class of 2020 and the class of 2021, right? Thanks be to God that we're at this place that we can do so. And so many thanks to faculty, staff, and administration <clears throat> for their diligence and perseverance, for those who kept us safe and well throughout this academic year. Um, I'm thinking of the COVID-19 task force. I'm thinking about students who lived on campus, residence life and student development. And a special shout out to Demona Wilson, who is the director of our student health services. And there's a wonderful article in uh, this week's Waltonian that highlights all of her efforts in keeping us safe and well during this pandemic. So we have much to be thankful for. So you probably wonder when the university chaplain speaks at chapel, um, what, what's going on, right? Is, is it something, uh, is it gonna be a pronouncement of something or uh, something like that? No. And, and just to let you know that um, in my years at Eastern, I know some people think, well, maybe he has a sermon always in his back pocket that he can just pull out and be able to offer on a, on a moment's notice. Actually, I have nothing in my pockets. Um, I am completely <laughs> pocketless, so to speak. I, I share in chapel generally what's, what's on my heart, right? So I don't know what that's always going to be months ahead, but this is something that I just wanted to share briefly with you this morning. I've been thinking a lot about Christian higher education. I've been thinking a lot about that and thinking about Eastern University and its unique place in Christian higher education. And I'm thinking also, what do we offer students? Now that might sound like a pretty simple you know, question, but we offer students a lot, a holistic experience of excellent education infused with a deep love of God and neighbor. And that's really a, a wonderful ethos. Um, we call it faith, reason, and justice for a reason. But as I think about our students, and I'm thinking here of current students and future students, I, I think one of our missions is to offer them in their four years, five years, six years, how long they are with us, a sense of tradition, tradition, offering them tradition. And I'll explain what I mean by tradition. It's what the Yale historian, the late Yaroslav Pelikan said about tradition. He said, tradition is the living faith of the dead. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. He also said that traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. We don't want that. We don't want traditionalism as a dead faith of the living. We want to offer in Christian higher education a sense that we pass on, we receive the tradition, and we pass on a tradition to our students, as well as people who are our colleagues, right? We have a tradition, and we pass on a tradition there. It's a wonderful and unique experience to be at a Christian university uh, because we offer an education, but we also offer good news. And what I would say there is the good news of Jesus Christ. We sung about it this morning, but we also embody it each and every day as we live our lives with each other. Now, by, by offering the good news of Jesus Christ, I wanna make sure that <clears throat> this is not done by any type of manipulation or coercion or by piling up a lot of Christian rules right? We do so because the Spirit leads us to love our students, both in word and deed, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we, we do this by, by offering this tradition to students. There are, of course, challenges on the way, right? When one generation passes on something to the next generation, there's always challenges. And I think we know, for some of us who have been here for a few years, that the demographics of our culture with regards to religiosity has changed, right? We have more and more people identify as nuns, and that's not in the Roman Catholic tradition, nuns, but N-O-N-E-S, right? Nuns meaning no religious affiliation, right? And, and that's interesting, uh, right? That's a percentage that has ticked up over the last decade. Some have estimated as, as high as 25 between 25 and 30 percent of people polled do not have any religious affiliation. So obviously the students that are drawn to Easton for many, many reasons 
uh, might also be part of that demographic, right? That there might be as much as, uh, as many as 25% of people that attend Eastern that are still on the journey of what is religion, what is a relationship with God. One thing I appreciate what President Matthews has said, and he said this in public, so this is not a private chaplain to President uh, breaking confidentiality here. He said this, and I want you to really listen to this. This is why this is what I think makes Eastern University very unique. He says, we are not only a Christian university for Christians, we are a Christian university for everyone. Now that's, that, you could put that on a t-shirt and that would really sell uh, well, but you have to believe that that's a radical statement. That is a really radical statement for an institution to take. That we're not just a Christian university for Christians, although we certainly welcome students and faculty, staff, administrators from across the wide spectrum of Christian tradition, but we're also a Christian university for everyone. So in a few moments, I just want to explore what do we mean for everyone? What do we mean for everyone? And how do we do that in a way that is compelling, winsome, and plausible for people? Now, I'm no sociologist, so like, like I said, when I talk about the nuns, I think that we have to realize that there are students, particularly I'm thinking of students that I have had focus groups with, as well as um, seen some surveys, that they need to hear the good news, right? They need to see the good news. They need to embrace the good news. So one of the things I've been thinking about recently is <clears throat> that Eastern University, as we move forward, in, in, our, in our journey in Christian higher education probably needs to think about, we used to have a model, I, it seemed, that was purely on discipleship, which is not a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not opposed to discipleship. We have many, many, many programs, one of them being the student chaplain program that focuses on uh, students who have committed their lives to Christ who want to do then service in kind of a discipleship way. But I do think that we need to move to be more missional to be more missional, to find ways of creative engagement with students uh, on their journey of faith. And I'm picking up on, on something the Apostle Paul said to his young mentee, Timothy. So I'm going to go there this morning, right? A mentor to a mentee about what it means to go and carry a tradition and how do you offer it to others. So you may know, certainly you know something about the Apostle Paul, Right, And you know that he wrote many letters in the New Testament. Three have been called the pastoral letters, First and Second Timothy and Titus. As a matter of fact, uh, Timothy and Titus and even Onesimus, which is found in the letter of Philemon, he calls them my children or my son, my sons. So there's a special relationship between Paul and in this case, Timothy. And Timothy is very interesting. Paul meets him in Acts uh, 16. As Paul is on a missionary journey, uh, Timothy, um, his mother was a Jewish woman who was a believer, his father a Greek, so he comes from a mi mixed ethnicity. Paul has him circumcised pragmatically so that Timothy can be uh, a witness to all, both Jews and Greeks. And, and then Paul places Timothy in the city of Ephesus, right? Uh, pretty hard city, difficult city, very pluralistic, a lot of Greco-Roman religions that were very prominent in the city of Ephesus in Asia Minor. So Paul is writing these letters to Timothy, who's caring for believers in Asia Minor in the, in the 60s, 60 CE. And some have thought that this second letter of Timothy, which I'm going to go to in a moment, was Paul's last letter, maybe his swan song, his final word uh, that he offers before he has his impending martyrdom um, in a couple of years after. So Timothy is a young believer. He's also a nervous fellow, right? So, you know, Paul offers the first century version of Pepsid AC when Paul says to Timothy, you know, don't drink only water, but take a little wine for the sake of your stomach ailments, right? So um, we have Mylanta, which is probably a little safer to use these days, but nevertheless, uh, Timothy is young and Timothy <clears throat> is nervous about this. So today we're going to look at, just briefly, um, a passage of uh, 2 Timothy 
that Paul writes to young Timothy to give him encouragement, instruction as a mentor to a mentee. Let me share that with you. If you have a Bible, you can certainly open to 2 Timothy, right? Um, and if you don't have a Bible uh, ready in front of you, I'll just share the screen and just read the text uh, for you. All right. I hope you can see this. It's been quite the challenging um, technology this morning. Thank you uh, to Sue Yavor again uh, for all the help there. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Just listen to God's word, and I will um, just highlight a couple things here. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Do not be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel relying on the power of God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but now it has been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel, I was appointed as a herald, and an apostle and a teacher, and for this reason I suffer as I do. But do not be ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have put my trust, and I am sure that he is able to God until that day what I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. God, the good treasure, entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. <clears throat> so friends, this morning, I just want to um, look at that last verse for a few moments. Can you see that? <clears throat> verse 14, God, the good treasure, entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. That to me is a powerful verse, one that I believe gives us an understanding of responsibility of passing on this tradition, what I'll call now the good treasure. And it's something that we guard and it's something that's entrusted to us as believers <clears throat> to be able to then offer to the next generation. Much like what Paul is offering to Timothy, mentor, mentee, we as a Christian institution of higher education, Eastern University, we are to God the good treasure that has been given to us and then be able to offer that to students, to, to, to new faculty, employees, staff, whomever, as a way of continuing the Christian tradition. It's interesting. Other translations have, you know, the good deposit, right? Um, other translation might even have things like um, God, the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. So there's a, a few ways to translate verse 14, but I just, this is the new revised standard version. So let's take a brief look this morning. What is implied by the good treasure? And of course, as you might imagine, there is a lot of debate about what exactly it is. I'm not that concerned about knowing exactly what it is, but if you look at the text, you can see what precedes it. In a couple of times, Paul mentions the gospel. Paul mentions the good news, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And I think that's what the good treasure, uh, the good deposit is implying, that there is a good news of Jesus Christ in which we're, we, are, we guard, not in a protectionistic sense, in the sense that 
<clears throat> we don't know what to do with it as much as we protect it in the sense of its congruency, right? Its, its resiliency in the ways in which we offer it to another. And here's the thought, right? The good treasure that Paul is speaking to Timothy here is not simply words. It's not simply doctrine. It's not simply a creed, although it certainly involves those things. But what Paul is mentioning here, I believe, is that the God, the good treasure, is it's a person. The good treasure is found in a person in the resurrected Jesus, whom right now we still recognize as someone who stayed on earth 40 days after Easter. You see, it's found in a person, God, the good treasure, entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living with us. When I think of the good news, I, I think of um, what I would consider here, uh, Mark's gospel, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, right? Mark perhaps being the earliest gospel in the canon, and this might be the earliest proclamation when Jesus comes on the scene. You know this verse very well. I just want to read it and listen and understand that this is part of what it means for the good treasure, the good deposit. Mark 1, 14 and 15. Now, when, after John was arrested, John the Baptist, <clears throat> Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And what was Jesus saying? The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news, right? I love that verse because to me, it encapsulates the good deposit, the good treasure in and person of Jesus of Nazareth. The time is fulfilled, the kairos, the gospel, the good news, the good deposit that we get a chance to continue to offer at, at Eastern University <clears throat> is not simply good news. I mean, excuse me, not simply good advice. It's not simply anecdotal. It is found in a person who invaded our time and space. Jesus sent his son, or God sent his son Jesus in Nazareth, uh, of Nazareth in history. It is news. It is as if you opened your Google news feed and that was a news report that Jesus of Nazareth came into our space. And it's interesting, when you think about the good news, the good deposit, the good treasure, there is a change that has to happen when people are offered it, right? It speaks about repentance, right? Repent and believe in the good news. Repentance is a hard concept, right? Even to talk about sometimes, because when we say repentance, it means that we are inadequate. We are incomplete. We are in need of forgiveness, reconciliation with God. We are sinful. And those concepts are sometimes hard to, to, because we want to keep improving ourselves in many ways. I like what Mike Iaconelli said, uh, the, the founder of Youth Specialties, when he came to Eastern University many years ago, he started off uh, the series of Faith Forum with his first um, address to students. His was Mike Iaconelli's first line, when I accepted Jesus into my life, he ruined it. He ruined it. I think what Iaconelli was talking about is that he had to change his ways. There was a sense of turning to Jesus and turning away from other things. And then, of course, believing, right? Believe in the good news, the gospel, the UN Galeon. Believe in the good news. And I think that's critically important as we begin to think about how we begin to understand uh, what our responsibility is here at Eastern University. Now, I'm going to go this through this briefly, but I encourage you, uh, I was thinking about what gets in the way, what might be some obstacles that might get in the way of uh, guarding this good deposit, right? And so there's a book that I would recommend. It's a small book that I try to read every year. It's called Henry Nowen's In the Name of Jesus, Christian Reflections on Leadership. It was written in uh, 1989. I try to read it once a year, and Nowen is reflecting upon the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew's gospel. So we won't have time to go through that passage in its entirety, but I, I want you to look at it at another time. It's Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And now one tells us that there are three temptations Jesus faced in the wilderness that was brought to him by the tempter, Satan. The first one was the temptation to be relevant, the temptation to be relevant when Jesus has been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And what does the tempter say? Command these stones to become loaves of bread. Well, you're hungry. 
you want to eat. That makes a lot of sense to me. But yet now one says, be careful about being overly relevant, right? Be careful about meeting immediate needs, all immediate needs. Now, let me just say this. I think the gospel, when I think about the gospel, um, it has to be contextualized. We have to bring the good news to a new generation. We have to be able to pass on that tradition to others. And it certainly looks different in 2021 than it would in 1921, right? There's just different issues, different things that we're wrestling with. But I do believe that too often Christianity becomes gimmicky, gimmicky, where we begin to become a little bit um, faddish. We become a little bit overly relevant and we begin to lose our identity. So I would argue to say that let's be relevant, but the temptation is not to lose our identity at any cost because we're trying to be relevant. We have to guard against being overly relevant. The second temptation that now in notes is when the tempter says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down and then angels will scoop you up and you will not be hurt. Um, now in calls that the temptation to be spectacular. <laughs> oh my, that could be a whole other chapel message, right? About things like celebrity churches, celebrity pastors, or sensationalizing Christianity. I remember having a conversation with a person who said, um, I don't think I'll go to church on this Sunday, this upcoming Sunday. And I said, oh, uh, why is that? You look healthy and are you going, are you traveling? Doing? No, 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 my pastor's on vacation. I said, well, that's really interesting, right? That we would only go when the pastor's there. So we think of the church too much connected to the person who may be speaking each and every week, but isn't the church, the body of Christ, right, that we should all be together. So we have to worry about being spectacular, being spectacular and understanding what that might imply. The third temptation now and says is when Satan offers to Jesus says this, all these kingdoms that I present to you, I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Oh my, that's the last one. The temptation to be powerful, right? The power that sometimes we have to guard against when we look at the ways in which we embody Christianity. We don't have to uh, talk about much more than Christian nationalism or the spirit of triumphalism. We have to worry, uh, worry about these things, right? Power, and sometimes power is something we can use for an advantage, but yet it is enticing and intoxicating. Randy Balmer, uh, Dr. Randy Balmer, who teaches at Dartmouth College, who has an honorary degree from Eastern University in 2008, wrote this. He says, the church has always done better when it was on the margins and not near the power, right? But on the margins, being a prophetic witness, I think we need to guard against being overly powerful. Last but not least, Paul says to Timothy, remember that you do this with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us, right? This is not something we do just in our own, in our own humanness, but we're relying on the Holy Spirit that is indwelling in us. The Holy Spirit is an important person of the Trinity for Eastern University, right? I know we talk a lot about Jesus, which we should. We talk about God the Father, but the Holy Spirit sometimes, um, we want to make sure we're, we're, we're being empowered by the Spirit that lives within us, and that we need not to worry if we talk too much about the Holy Spirit, that people get a little worried that uh, <laughs> maybe we're going to become charismatic, Pentecostal. You know, what will happen if Joe starts swinging on the chandeliers in his office? What's going on here, right? We need not to worry. The Holy Spirit always will lead us in places of deeper holiness and empowerment, right? Regardless of where you are in that continuum. The Holy Spirit is called Advocate, Comforter, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, is the one who we recall the things he's taught us. So think of spiritual disciplines as Holy Spirit living within us and that we cultivate these. Think about we're having daily prayer Monday through Friday, right, at 730. I don't know if some of you have had the opportunity, but that's one of the ways that we're relying on the Holy Spirit living within us to be able to live out the ways in which we guard the good deposit. Also, we have Nancy Hartsock, who does so wonderfully well as our prayer email coordinator, right? In a way that practicing the discipline through email 
that we can be relying on with the help of the Holy Spirit living within us. There are things that we do as a community. There are things that we need to continue to do. And we need to know that our responsibility, of course, is curricular and co-curricular. But as a Christian university, we also have this responsibility of guarding the good treasure that has been entrusted to us, right? We've been given something that we ought to then pass on, so to speak, literally, to offer the good news of Jesus to everyone we meet on campus. And we do so not our, our, with our own agendas, but with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. And we say amen and amen to that. And I will turn it over to our president, uh, Matthews, to close us out. Thank you, University Chaplain Modica, for your timely, informative, gospel-focused, and missional instruction and perspective based on 2 Timothy. Thank you for sharing your generous service and love, not only for us, but also for modeling a holy tradition to our community and beyond. We thank God for you. We also thank our spirit-led musicians and our tech and prayer teams for their faithful and sensitive ministry. We will now open the chat room to share our praises, our prayer needs, and encouragements after which we will receive the benediction. Let's pray together. Now let us receive the benediction taken from Psalm 119 and an excerpt from 2 Timothy. May the Lord be gracious to us according to God's promises. May our lips overflow with praise. May our tongues sing of God's word. May God's hands help us. May the Holy Spirit keep us in life that we may guard the good treasure entrusted to us. Now go in peace and in the joy and strength of our living Lord and Savior, 
Jesus Christ. Have a great day. God bless you. Be well.